and welcome to the last section of chapter 26. Here we're going to look at the large intestines and what's going on. So the large intestine starts here at this region called the cecum. Um, materials from the ileum move into the cecum through this ileocecal valve, which is typically closed, but um, opens when there is a movement of materials into the stomach. That's typically what stimulates uh, this ileocecal reflex. Um, hanging off of the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestines, is this tiny little structure here called the vermiform appendix. The appendix doesn't have a lot of function now, but it does play a role in um, our digestive system in producing the good bacteria. It always, or it typically harbors a um, group of bacteria that when um, some infection occurs and we have to take like antibiotics uh, that will kill off the bacteria in the intestines, the um, appendix will repopulate the large intestines uh, with the bacteria because it always holds a group of those bacteria in them in the appendix. Uh, the appendix also could potentially uh, help us then in our immune system in um, activating immune system cells, kind of keeping those cells on their feet since our immune system is very predominant around the digestive system anyways. From the cecum, we move into the colon. So here, this entire structure that kind of um, forms a portrait around the, or like the frame of a portrait around the small intestines is known as the large intestines or colon. And we have an ascending colon, a transverse colon, a descending colon, a sigmoid colon, that leads to the rectum and then the anus. And within the anus, we have an external anal sphincter and an internal anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is composed of smooth muscle, whereas the external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle. So we control this sphincter, but this um, smooth muscle sphincter up here is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And when that um, sphincter stimulates and opens, that's when we feel a very big push to defecate. So one of the disorders associated with the large intestines is then appendicitis. So the appendix is a very, um, is not an organ that does a lot for the digestion itself, but it does help in um, keeping the large intestines colonized with the good bacteria that we need. Because the appendix is where it is though, if any material gets stuck in that appendix region, it can actually cause um, bacteria to grow rapidly and eventually it can cause swelling and um, damage that appendix. If that happens, the appendix could um, swell up and eventually burst. And if that happens, then we would end up um, being very septic, and that could kill us. So appendicitis is um, inflammation of the appendix, and the pain will come on typically quite suddenly. You feel very, very ill. You can't eat. Your umbilical region, when you push on it and release, um, causes you to really have a lot of pain. Um, the only or the, mate, the the only treatment for appendicitis is to remove the appendix um, via an appendectomy. They usually will do that as an immediate surgery. So it's typically not a surgery that most people have to worry about. But anything that you have to cut someone open, you know, could potentially cause problems. The histology of the large intestines um, is simple columnar epithelium with um, the mucosal layer, the internal layer, um, composed of many 
cells called goblet cells. There are no villi. We don't need to, we're not absorbing near as much. In this area, we're mainly going to absorb um, any remaining vitamins and all the remaining water. The goal of the large intestines is to form that compact fecal ball that can be released, and that's all the waste that we don't need anymore. Um, we then have we have um, mucus cells that secrete mucus to lubricate the large intestines. Um, we have two layers of muscul muscularis uh, that will can, uh, will allow for movement. Um, the large intestines has different types of movement, slightly different types, I should say, of movement than the small intestines. So you can see the different layers. Um, you have the muscular mucosa, you have the um, two layers here, the circular and longitudinal muscles, you have the um, inner layer, the mucosal layer right here. Um, and there's a lot of different cells uh, that make up this large intestine, the epithelial lining of the large intestines. There are lots of different bacteria. The main bacteria that we typically talk about, E. coli, um, are found in that large intestines, but there's a lot of other bacteria as well. Um, they function to help in um, breaking down certain materials that haven't been broken down yet, and um, they help in producing certain vitamins. So if those vitamins, if those bacteria aren't there, we can't produce the vitamins that are needed for things like blood cell production. Um, the large intestines doesn't really use peristaltic movement, where we're just moving materials towards the um, from one end to the next end of the large intestines. We use um, haustral churning, where each section, known as a haustra of the small intestine, or of the large intestines, um, will, will fill with materials, and then we'll move the materials back and forth from one haustra to another haustra. And eventually, we'll move it um, further and further along in that large intestines. Mass movements. Um, this moves the material very quickly towards the rectum, um, and this can happen anywhere from one to three or four times daily, um, depending on the types of food and the amount of food you eat. Uh, usually this occurs after a meal, which is why usually after a meal you have to go to the bathroom. Um, Gastrocolic reflex is what initiates a mass movement. So when the stomach starts getting um, filled, that causes us to release the material that's in our large intestines so that we have room for the next material to move in. Um, defecation reflex occurs when the rectum, the end of that large intestine, fills up and causes us to want to get rid of that waste. Um, typically, this occurs uh, a, the ability to control defecation occurs at around age two to three years of age, but this can, I mean, take us, you know, until we're four or five sometimes. Some children are younger. It just depends. So within the colon, there are structures that arise oftentimes. These are called polyps. So there's a pol this is a large polyp. There's a smaller polyp there. Um, a polyp is just an outgrowth. And a lot of times these polyps don't have, are, aren't um, a cause for worry. But they can be um, precancerous or they can be cancerous. Uh, and so if you, or so not if. So when you have a, a colonoscopy at around age 50, most people start having colonoscopies, um, if they find a polyp, they will typically remove it using this tiny snare. What they do is they put the snare around the, the polyp and then they tighten the snare and the snare will get really, really hot and just basically burn right through that polyp, um, cauterizing the wound and everything. Then they look to see if there's any um, cancer-looking cells in it. If there are, 
then they'll do more tests. If there aren't, then they'll tell you. Um, risk factors for um, colon cancer and so for polyps, um, low fiber diets. If you have a history of cancer, your age, can, of course, everything. As you get older, you have more. Pr you're more prone to a lot of things. And if you have um, ulcerative colitis. Another disorder, diverticulosis. Um, these are little pockets found within the stomach or within the large intestine lining. So these little pockets here. Um, they usually form as we get older, um, typically because we have a very low fiber diet. So if you don't get enough vegetables and fruits, you're more prone to this. If you don't take in enough water, then you're more prone to this disorder. Um, this disorder itself isn't going to cause as many problems. It's when the um, diverticula get inflamed. When the diverticula get inflamed, then we have a problem, and that's known as diverticulitis. And this can be life-threatening because these diverticula are formed from this um, colon tissue, and so it's basically um, thinner, a thinner region of the colon, and if you inflame it, it can actually cause that diverticula to rupture. And then you have intestinal material spilling out into the abdominal cavity or the pelvic cavity. Um, two other not near as serious but still problematic disorders, constipation. This is the inability to defecate, oftentimes associated with low fiber diets or dehydration. So um, if you're constipated, add some fiber, drink some water, and get moving. So if you are a couch potato, then you're less likely to have materials moving. But the more you move, the more your stomach will churn. The more, well, I won't say stomach, I'll say the more your intestines will move, and that will actually influence um, defecation. Diarrhea is the opposite. So this is associated with um, the inability to not defecate. So you end up having very, very liquid um, uh, fecal matter coming out at a very rapid rate. Um, oftentimes can be associated with um, an infection if you have some type of a bacterial or viral infection. Um, this can also be associated with um, having certain materials in your diet that cause you to pull out the solutions um, very fast or pull, pull out materials before they can get absorbed. If you have something in your intestines, you're trying, they're trying to release all the material from the intestines like through one of those cleansing diets things that can actually cause diarrhea. Um, when you have diarrhea, obviously you're not going to be absorbing all those nutrients, so there's going to be other problems, and you're going to um, need more water in this case too. So both of these, you're going to want to make sure that you have enough water because this one um, can cause dehydration, whereas this one is due to dehydration, if that makes sense. So I'm done with the lecture. I'm going to post this video and then um, you'll be ready for the next chapter. Have a wonderful day. Bye.